see, so take note of that. For our uh, prayer concerns, uh, the flowers that are on the organ that I brought out this morning are from Dolly Shook's uh, funeral, and we want to um, lift that family as her service was this last August 23rd. And then we also want to uh, pray for the families of Joanna Bootsma of Sanborn, that's Jan Pearson's mom, uh, and pray for their family uh, as uh, that funeral will be tomorrow at 11 o'clock at the Cornerstone United Reformed Church. Visitation will be today. Uh, family will be there from 1 to 3 o'clock at the uh, funeral home in Sanborn. Also uh, for uh, prayers, uh, that have changed. Anna Mae Hargens is now in Hartwood Heights. And then uh, we noted that Lynn Wills has been dealing with some infection. We want to pray for him uh, in, in this coming week. He missed his uh, meeting that he was going to have with the doctors this week. Those are the updates that I have. Any others that anyone would like to share at this time? If not, oh, yes. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Alina. Alina asked for prayers for, was it Millie Smith? Vicki Vicky Smith, um, who under, just underwent some surgery, and then also for the family of Russell Smith, who had a funeral this last week. So, thank you. Any others? If not, then let us stand and greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ. in wonder and awe to seek the face of God and long to experience God's embrace. We come hungry to encounter the word and parch for renewal and restoration. Become weary and worn, but in wonder and awe as God reveals his divine self to us. Ah, God shoulders our burdens and grants us peace. May we are changed by God's love and grace. Please join me in the opening prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, Lord of heaven and earth, of whom and through whom and to whom all things are, we glorify your majestic grace. Hear us this morning as we call upon you with prayer, with song and voice, and reading of your holy word. May this be a time to renew our hearts and our commitment to you. May praise you with the great love you have given and shown to us in Jesus Christ our Lord, our spring of living water. Amen. Our opening song is the God of Abraham. It's number 34 and on the screen.
please join me in the prayer of confession. Loving and forgiving God, we are in conflict. We want to be followers of Christ, but we cling to our own desires and plans. We want to be filled with joy, but are upset with worry and anxiety. We long for a vibrant prayer life, but our busy lives leave us tired and afraid of solitude. We confess that we subscribe to the allures of this world, having more, doing more, running faster and harder, and all the while we fail to see the needs of our neighbors and ignore the needs of our own souls. Forgive us as we pray. Renew within us our will receive your grace. Refresh our spirits by cleansing rain here by me. Rekindle within us faith, compassion, and generosity. We ask this is in the name of our Savior and friend, Jesus Christ. Amen. Scripture tell us if we live according to the flesh, we will die. But if we live according to the Spirit, we put to death the cravings of our body. We will live as a fountain of living water, will cleanse us through and through. Friends, believe in the good news. For in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. seated. I received a call this morning that Logan is uh, apparently not feeling well, so he's not going to be having a tuba solo this morning. So I would at this time invite the children to come down for this morning's children message. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you doing? Good. good. That's good. Did you guys start school this week? Yeah. Yeah, you did. How do you like school? Good. Good? Oh, some not so good. <laughs> some are like, well, maybe. Well, I need your help this morning. Can you guys see what I have on this plate in front of me? Apples and a snicker. That's correct. Now, can you tell me which one is better for you, healthier for you to eat? Apples. Apples? And you said this one? Why do you say the Snickers? Because it tastes better. Oh, <laughs> okay. So if it tastes better, then that means it's healthier for you. Well, I think that's what we think often. But have you ever heard of the saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away? No? <laughs> They're shaking their head. No. That must be an old saying. That's what I was told when I was growing up. I mean, uh, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. We actually had apple trees out on our farm, and I would go out and pick apples even when they were green and eat them. But um, apples are supposed to be good for you. Actually, apples are better than this Snickers bar, so I'm going to put the Snickers bar away, okay? Um, so if apples are healthier for you to eat, uh, we're going to actually talk about a text this morning where, um, where Jeremiah says that... Um, the people were eating, were not eating, but they were, they were turning to things that were unhealthy, that were unhealthy for them spiritually, things that they should, have, should not have been turning to. Um, can you think of things that, as Christians, we should turn to, some things that we should do as Christians? What are some things we should do as, as believers in Jesus? 
Can you think of things we should do? Yes? Read the Bible. Read the Bible. That's one. Yes? Eat healthy things. Eat healthy things. Well, yeah, that would be good. We're supposed to put healthy things in our body. Yes? Brush your teeth. Well, that would be that would make you healthier. Yes, but what about healthier in the sense spiritually? You said um, read the Bible. Um, what are some other things along that? Well, believing is important. Yes, pray. That's good. Praying. Um, how about what you're doing today? Yeah, coming to church is helping you become healthier spiritually. Okay, and what? What God said the people were doing, they were turning away from God, and they were actually worshiping a junk God, a, a false God, and it was a false God called Baal. It was something people made up to worship. It wasn't a real God, but it was a fake God. And uh, sometimes we do things that take us away from God, like maybe not obeying your parents, or maybe fighting amongst yourselves, maybe fighting with your brother and sister. You guys don't do that, do you? <laughs> now tell the truth, you're in the church. <laughs> um, sometimes we do things that actually are wrong, that take us away from God. And uh, that's what God's talking about here. He, he wants people to come back to him and uh, to follow him and his ways and to do things that make us spiritually healthy. So this morning... We're going to, uh, I'm going to give you guys uh, a piece of apple, and I washed them, and I have this neat little uh, tool that takes the core out, and then you guys can all have a slice, okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six, I think I only have to do one apple, and that will take care of all of you. Let's see if this works, okay? You ever seen one of these? Mm -hmm. Have you? Okay. I've tried it before, but you have to have a, ooh, <laughs> it's a little juicy one. Uh. Push it through, and it takes out the core. Isn't that cool? And then you guys can all have a slice. So what I'm going to do is give you these uh, apple slices to remind you that um, we should eat healthy things. That's the core. That's the thing you don't want to eat. That has the seeds in it. So what you have here is just the apple slices. So I want you to, to take these, and this is going to remind you to not only eat healthy, but to do healthy things in regard to God. Like you said, pray, read your Bible, come to church, come to Sunday school, come to Logos when that starts. Those are all things that can help us healthy spiritually, okay? So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gifts that you give to us. We thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, uh, who is the fountain of living water that helps us uh, do those things which keep us uh, close to you, O oh God. Help us to remember to read our Bibles, to pray, to come to church, to Sunday school, to come to Logos. Lord, help us to uh, maintain a healthy spiritual life uh, as well as a healthy physical life. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I think there's enough slices for everybody to have one. And I cleaned them so they're fresh and they should be cold. So are they good? All right. Need one? Okay, all right. Thank you. You guys can go back to your seats. I better take the uh, candy bar out of my pocket or we'll have melted chocolate. So. <laughs> At this time, we will have our first offering, and this will be for the Property Needs Fund. <laughs>
Testament reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 4 through 13. Hear the word of the Lord, you descendants of Jacob and all you clans of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me? So they strayed from me so far from me. They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren and wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives. I brought you to a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce, but you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, following worthless idols. Therefore I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord. And I will bring charges against your children's children. Cross over to the coast of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar, then observe closely. See if there has ever been anything like this. Has the nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods at all, but my people have exchanged your glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder at your great horde, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Him, next to him is Fill My Cup, Lord. It's on 
When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews are, are not to associate with Samaritans. And Jesus said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the de well is very deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than Father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him as a spring water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me some of this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. <clears throat> Amen. Now, when you heard Paul read the passage from Jeremiah, when you heard the word cistern, that should have, for at least some of you, created an immediate word picture. But please don't concern, uh, uh, confuse a cistern with a septic tank. They're, they're not the same. One holds water, the other holds human waste. This is a cistern. This is one that happens to set outside the house. Uh, in our house on the farm, the family farm, we had one that was inside. It was made out of concrete. It had a spout coming down from the eaves that you had a little lever you could turn, and the water would either go in the house or it would run out on the ground. Now notice also, um, and when we used it, I remember growing up, we used it as soft water to wash clothes. That water was soft, so they use it to wash clothes. And if you didn't use it on a regular basis, or you didn't get enough rain, sometimes that water would become stagnant and stale. And for some of the older systems, uh, like this one, you can see on the corner, it, it has a leak. Uh, there's a little dark spot running down. That older cisterns, that seemed to be a problem. Archaeologists have uncovered thousands of cisterns in the Holy Land, uh, this is just one example of many. In our trip on Israel, we saw um, cisterns like this, and many of them were quite large. They were collecting water from as much a resource as they could, and the cistern was a valuable asset to them in that, in that community. The land there was arid, the rains were unpredictable, and so when it did rain, it was important to gather as much rain as you could as a resource. But even then, the supply was probably not adequate to provide for all of their needs, and it was often a last resort for them to return to. Because of, uh, they still had trouble with the stagnant uh, factor as well. They also didn't have concrete or plastic holding tanks that we have today, so a broken cistern or one that was cracked or leaked was quite common. And so this water imagery that Jeremiah is giving the people of Israel uh, would have been something that would have been a vivid imagination for them. First, because they lived in a marginally fertile land where crops were at risk due to the amount of rainfall. And second, the people of Israel had a vivid memory of going back to Moses when they were in the Holy Land where God supplied them with water in the middle of nowhere 
by Moses striking a rock that was living water for them, that kept them alive in that desert. And third, Jeremiah is also writing at a time which we believe that the Babylonians are attacking. And it could very well be they have cut off their water supply and they are now having to depend on those cisterns. And many of them could have been broken at the time. So there's a, a, an imagery that's uh, it's being created for them. In Jeremiah, it's interesting, as he addresses the people, it's like he's giving a, a verdict that a judge would make uh, on the people. You, you may have heard the words, Therefore I bring charges against you, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns. They've turned to worthless idols, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Now Israel is forsaking the Lord, has broken a covenant that God has made with them. And it goes all the way back to the people of the time of Moses uh, when he led them out of Egypt. It was a Deuteronomic covenant called a suzerainty treaty. This suzerainty treaty was something that was quite commonly used uh, for when a warring nation uh, was more powerful and they overtook another nation, a lesser nation, and they would have a suzerainty treaty where the, the nation that was weaker would have to uh, obey and follow a set of rules that larger nation set for like protection, to protect their borders. Now when the suzerainty treaty was made between Moses and, and his people, or between God and his people, uh, this was a little bit different. Uh, notice that um, Israel's covenant uh, is that God, who is the stronger one, uh, is making a covenant with his people. And it goes back to Deuteronomy 4.4. 4. Basically, it said, you keep my statutes, you keep all of my commandments, and, and I'm going to go with you. Wherever you go, I will be there. I will protect you. I will guard you. You'll have this, this land flowing of milk and honey, and it will not only be for you, but your children after you. That was this covenant agreement that was made with the people. And now Jeremiah is saying, you're reneging on that. You're not, you're not following through what you said you were due. So their reference of digging their own cisterns or broken cisterns that cannot hold water, God is making fun of or poking fun at them that you're, you're turning to worthless idols, things that cannot save you. And so what is it that, what is it that they have done? What has the nation done? What, what covenant did they break? We can go to that next slide with, uh, with uh, I kind of reversed some things there. Sorry, Brad. Um, goes back to the Ten Commandments. And in Hebrew, you've got to remember it reads right to left, so it's not the one on the, on the left, it's the one on the right on the top. You shall have no other gods before you. The first commandment. That's what they had broken. They had turned to other gods. Uh, and the other gods were useless that could not save them. And God is saying, I am the fountain of living water, and this is your choice? You turn to these useless gods? Uh, and another tragedy on all this, if you have your Bibles open, was that even the priests were turning away from God. They were directing them not to God, but to, to other gods like Baal. So the people were even being led astray by, by the ones that were supposed to be bringing them back. And God's own covenant people, including their leaders then, had turned away from what was the very best of their lives to the one who was going to bring glory for them to pursue something that was inferior, that was the rest who are worthless. And so the prophet Jeremiah asked this question. He says, and I like this question, what kind of nation exchanges the glory of God for a worthless idol? Who does that? Who does that? You would have think the nation of Israel would have known better. But you see, humanity has not learned its lesson because some 1,400 years later, Jesus comes upon a woman at the well. An interesting story, a woman who has been trying to satisfy her thirst for life in all the wrong ways. 
She knew a lot about God, if you heard in the text. She even knew about Jacob. She considered Jacob a part of their lineage. And so she knew about God. But Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was going to give you a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you this living water. You see, Jesus is offering her more than just water for her physical need. The woman has satisfied her thirst by doing her own things, living with a man who was not her husband. She had had five husbands even before that. And so the point of the whole story is that Jesus is not just talking about water. He's talking about something greater, living water, or perhaps living or eternal life. Because he says, everyone who drinks of this water is going to be thirsty again, referring to the the water in the well. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give will be in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Jesus is inviting her to come to him as the source of living water. Her pathetic efforts, she's been trying to do it all on her own. And it's done nothing to actually but disappoint her. I mean, think about it. She has ruined her life up to this point. She's lived with others as well. She's ruined the lives of others as well. Her life was indeed like a broken cistern. She was alienated from her community, her family, herself. The reason she was coming out at this time of day was probably no one else comes at that time of day. So it's odd that she met Christ. But all of the life in her, in a sense, had had leaked out like a broken cistern. At this point, she's really desperate and she's hopeless. And Jesus offers her the spring of living water that came into her life. And he was offering her again more than just water. He's offering her life to the fullest. We didn't read the part of the text where she finally gets it. But when she does, it's like this living water is flowing in her and bubbling out of her. She can't help but to tell the rest of her community, all of her friends, who she has just met that has offered this living water to her. And so 2,000 years after Christ now, it seems we still thirst. We still have a thirst for life in all the wrong ways. And I'll ask that question again. What kind of nation exchanges a God of glory for a worthless idol? And I saw some of you say, we do. And it really does fly in the face of us today. Our nation has taken God out of just about everything we can. Uh, So far, we can still worship in a church and we can talk about God. We can preach about God. But we have exchanged God for worthless idols. Pascal said uh, an interesting quote. He said, human beings are peculiar in that they will pursue ends they know will bring them no satisfaction. They will gorge themselves with food that cannot nourish and with pleasures that cannot please. It seems that's just inherent within us. Uh, it's, uh, that is, seems to be what happens because all too often don't we settle for pretend relationships? We look for intimacy, intimacy in all the wrong places, perhaps on the internet. We seek thrills that endanger our lives. We, we try and escape reality. And instead of living water, we dig, uh, we, we search for a, a drug to sedate our pain, whether it's alcohol or some kind of other drug. We live in fear, but we seem to be more afraid of God than living an empty life. And whether we're poor or affluent, it seems to be in our nature to go after broken cisterns. So Jeremiah charges from God actually apply to us as well, as we are also guilty of digging broken cisterns and worshiping worthless things in this world. The only thing different between us and Jeremiah is uh, we have more things available to lead us astray, to satisfy those deep longing and thirst of our lives. We pile up worldly possessions and seek that which gives us pleasure. We're still playing that absurd game of trying to build our own broken cisterns while streams of God, streams of living water are right next to us. For God never leaves us nor forsakes us. He is always there. Those waters are always there 
And God is calling and inviting us to come, but all too often we turn the deaf ear to what God is saying. And it's not that having a legitimate deep thirst and longing in our life is bad. It's not, it, it is part of what we thirst for. We remember we're created in God's image. We're made in God's image. These thirsts, this need to thirst is a part of how God has created us. So having a thirst for things is not bad in itself. It's a basic human need. However, the question is, how are we going to fulfill those cravings, those needs, of those basic needs there? You see, it's not a sin to be thirsty, but how we satisfy those longings is. It's not a sin for us to desire love, but how we decide to meet our need for that love is. It's not a sin to want meaning and purpose in our own life, but when our life's central purpose and meaning don't align with God's will, that's a problem. It's not a sin for us to desire freedom unless we're wanting to be free of God and all moral restraints. And it's not a sin to want to be happy, but trying to meet our longings for happiness outside the will of God is not only wrong, it's destructive for us. It's kind of like drinking smelly, stagnant water that's at the bottom of a broken cistern. Why is this so tragic? And why is this so unnecessary for us? Well, Jeremiah is saying to the people, they have a choice. And he's saying to us as well, we have a choice. We can go on trying to supply the desires of life our way, or we can come to God and have our deepest longings met. We can try and make our lives work by our own efforts, or we can ask God for his presence to fill our lives. We can either do it our way or we can do it God's way. We can follow God's plan or we can follow our plan or we follow God's plan. I think we need to remember we are a covenant people. That's part of who we are. Uh, not only just because our name uh, from ECO, a covenant order of evangelical Presbyterians, is a part of our name, but it's what we do when we baptize. It's a covenant we make there. It's a covenant we make when we come before the communion table. Our lives are based on a covenant as Christians between us and God. We have a choice then of living water that is eternal or broken cisterns that are temporary. And if we want eternal riches, it will, it will cost us everything. If we want to have that eternal life, there is a cost that we have. Paul said in Philippians 3.8, he said, I consider everything a loss or everything worthless if we compare it to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. He says, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, those things of this world rubbish, that I might gain Christ. So I ask, which is worse for us? Giving up everything here to get everything eternally? Or giving up everything that is eternally to satisfy the thirst of our temporary things here on earth? And what will happen to us when we stand before God? What excuse are we going to give for the final audit of our life? How are we going to explain to God that we were just too busy living our lives, doing trivial things that we never really thought about eternal things? How will we explain that we are so busy refilling and repairing our broken cisterns that we never took advantage of the living water that was just right there beside us? C.S. Lewis said, Christianity is false. And it, if, if it is false, it is of no importance. If it's true, it is of infinite importance. But he said the one thing we must not do is call it moderately important. The ultimate cost of not living for God is coming to the end of life knowing that we have missed the meaning of life. The good thing for us is, is that Jesus is out there calling, saying to us, if anyone is thirsty, 
come to me and drink. Drink the living water that he offers to us. Friends, may we seek this living water that is being offered to us and not the broken cisterns of the world. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, our Father, we, we do truly thank you that we were created in your image. And not only were we created in your image, Lord, you came down to us uh, in the image of man so that you might be like one of us. But Lord, you did so much more for us that we, can, we can't even begin to fathom. You not only became like us, you died for us. And in dying for us, you defeated death that held, uh, held us back. And you have given us that hope of eternal life. Lord, we thank you that in giving us that eternal life that we can have this spring, this fountain of living water offered to us. That we can live for you in this world eternally. And remind us, O oh Lord, that, that we are a covenant people. We have made a covenant with you. If we join church, if we were baptized, if we take communion, we have made a covenant that, that Lord, we will follow you and that we will obey all of your commands. Help us, O oh Lord, to stay true to that covenant. And, O oh Lord, instill within us a, a new and a fresh spirit that, that flows like springs of living water and that we might be like the Samaritan woman when we finally get it, that we go out and, and we just can't hold back the news of who you are as our Lord and Savior and, and what you offer to us. And grant us courage, O oh Lord, that we might uh, take a hard look at ourselves to see where those broken cisterns are, those things that are idols, those things that are taking us away from you. Lord, help us to name them and uh, give them up and to follow you. And Lord, we, we come to you this day praying for uh, the needs of the church, uh, for those who are on our prayer chain of concerns and Lord, we want to pray for, for Carol Ryder, who's recuperating at home, the, uh, a prayer of thanks for Anna Mae that she's now back in Hartwood Heights. And Lord, we pray for Ted and Ruth Crawl as they continue to recover and Ted continues to lose some of the water weight. We just pray for him. And for Lynn Wills, who uh, is dealing with some infection, we pray for healing for him. We also lift up Terry Burns as she continues to heal, and Elijah Jansma as his battle with cancer, as well as Connie with her, her battle against uh, alopecia. And Lord, we also want to pray for Helena's uh, uh, friend, for Vicki, uh, who's uh, recovering from surgery at their home, Lord. We just pray for a good recovery for her. And for those who have lost loved ones, Lord, we, we pray for Jan Pearson and her family as they have lost her mother, Johanna. And we pray for them uh, today as they have their family uh, gathering. And Lord, also for tomorrow when they will come and have their funeral, Lord, we pray for your presence and your comforting arms to be around them. We also lift up the family and friends of Dolly Shook, whose, whose funeral was this last uh, Tuesday. And also the family of Leslie Dewan and for Sheila and her family uh, for Leslie's loss and also for Irma Winter and the loss of their granddaughter, her granddaughter Sally and for the rest of the family uh, as they deal with that. And Lord, also for uh, uh, the family of Russell Smith who, who also uh, has a, a funeral upcoming and uh, we pray for that family and friends as well. We also pray, O oh Lord, for uh, those in the world, especially those uh, who have lost their lives in the earthquake in Italy, and Lord, be with those, uh, that nation, as they uh, attempt to recover and uh, deal with the loss that they're dealing with, not only loss of lives, but loss of homes. And Lord, we pray for those uh, who serve in our distant lands, uh, who work and serve in harm's way. For those who are our, our service men and women, we lift up. Uh, we pray for um, Michael Leathers, for Kayla Hoback, for Amber Brown, Ed Smithback, Darren Tenaple, for Jake Bartholomew, 
for Dylan Flewelling, for Matt Cruz, and any others we, we lift up in prayer, as well as for them as their families back home. And Lord, we, we pray that you, O oh Lord, would empower us with the power of your Holy Spirit, that we might be able to resist the temptation to follow the broken cisterns of this world instead of turning to you, our fountain of living water. And may we, O oh Lord, strive to be your true disciples of Jesus Christ, and that we might pray the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we will collect our second offering, which is our mission fund offering. The scripture for today comes from Proverbs 25, verse 21, which says, If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. And then uh, the subnote there says, But if you're concerned about his soul, give him water that comes from Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, all that we are and all that we have are because of your unmerited favor in our lives. Thank you for the privileges of being entrusted with so much. Thank you for the opportunity to use your blessings to bless others. And so we faithfully and joyfully give to you, desiring that you use these offerings to sow and to reap bountifully for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And our closing hymn is Springs of Living Water. This is a, a new one for us. Uh, I was looking for a song that fit our theme about living water. And it's a fairly simple song, and it moves rather quickly. So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, see how we do.
So today, as you leave this place, I bid you to drink from the springs of living water, a supply that, that will never end for us, and receive now the benediction of our Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, our more Lord our God, and the blessings of the Holy Spirit, and the fount of God's love be with you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.